on from falling into all sorts of delusions and illusions. And that's going to be the subject of today's talk for you. Now for the title of this talk. Thaumaturgy, the dictionary meaning is the performance or the ability to perform magic and or miracles. Well, what does it have to do with science at all? It shouldn't even be in the same room as science, of course, you'd say. It should belong to history or preferably to prehistory. But sadly, it doesn't. Hence this talk, because it certainly permeates all around us. It's permeated everything. Let's first look in a systematic way, again, thanks to Google God. Let's look at the various synonyms of thaumaturgy. What are all the things, without any prejudgment about thaumaturgy? Let's look at all the synonyms. Quite an impressive list. In Roger's Thesaurus, 2013 edition, there are actually 57 of these synonyms. That means essentially the same thing. As you know, synonym means essentially more or less the same meaning. These include, a very interesting list, abracadabra, <laughs> alchemy, astrology, oops, bewitchment, conjuration, devilry, diabolism, divination, exorcism, horoscopy, oops again, illusion, legerdemain, necromancy, occultism, prestidigitation, prophecy, soothsaying, sorcery, superstition, I underline that, taboo, trickery, again to be underlined, voodoo, very obvious and very, very blunt, witchcraft, black art, fortune telling, hocus pocus, <laughs> slate of hand, and so on. These are all the synonyms of thaumaturgy. So you now get a pretty good idea of what thaumaturgy is all about. Okay. What about the antonyms of thaumaturgy? What are the opposites of thaumaturgy? As decided by not just the thesaurus, which by the way is predicated upon public usage and how people's understanding of what words mean, the list of the antonyms of thaumaturgy is much shorter and much sweeter. And you'll be surprised, there are only three entries. One, fact. Two, truth. Three, reality. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, nothing more need, more need be said. I can rest my case right here. But now we can ask, what about science? What does the thesaurus have to say about science? We all know what is science when we see it. But what does the thesaurus say about science? And it says something very revealing. The list of synonyms is much, much smaller. But again, it shows that our normal understanding of what science is a little abbreviated. It's a little too restricted. Here's what the thesaurus says about science. Entry number one, perhaps because of the alphabetical order, art. So that's one in the face for those who think that science and art are poles apart. Good science and good art are not very far apart, really. Art. Discipline. Education. Information, learning, skill, system, technique, branch, erudition, lore, scholarship, wisdom, body of knowledge. I think that's a pretty good all-encompassing uh, group of synonyms for what science is. Now you could ask the other side, what are the antonyms of science? What's opposite to science? The list, once again, is short and sweet, just three words. Disorder, disorganization, ignorance. And I think it says it all. I could just stop the talk right here, and you'd have had a pretty good idea of what the role of thaumaturgy is and whether we should have it around or not. But of course, we have to go ahead and analyze what's going on, and that's what I propose to do. Why did thaumaturgy start in the first place? Where did this come from? Well, through the ages until fairly recent years, the nature of our world and our place in the physical universe remained largely unknown to people. Physical phenomena appeared to be mysterious beyond explanation of any kind, rational explanation. Invoking thaumaturgy of various kinds then served a double purpose. 
First, it provided an explanation, quote unquote, of otherwise inexplicable phenomena. Second, perhaps more significantly, it helped foster the illusion of a degree of control by sufficiently adept human beings over the laws of nature. And that's very important for us to understand this business of control. This illusion, because it's an illusion, included the notion that such adepts could even override or suspend the laws of nature at will. So those who do this and produce magic are, if you believe it literally, suspending the laws of nature. Those who are rising and levitating are suspending the laws of nature, if you can believe it. And if they bring you to believe it, then you, they have become powerful people. These adepts obviously gained throughout history, they gained and exercised great power over the general populace with adverse consequences that have roiled humankind throughout history. But that's another story altogether. We won't get into that today. With the advent of science and its systematic methodology, however, the belief that natural phenomena could function in such arbitrary ways became far less tenable. The credibility of the capricious suspension of the laws of nature ought to have disappeared right then. But practically the opposite has happened. And it's our business to understand why and what we can do about it. In the last 60 years or so, science and technology have advanced at a pace that has far outstripped the ability of the population at large to keep up with it at a psychological and a sociological level. In other words, there has not been a significantly commensurate sociological and societal enlightenment, or at least not one that's deep enough or profound enough or permanent enough. Humankind has for the most part, we have progressed. We have now rejected notions such as slavery or the divine right of kings to rule over the rest of human beings, of the human beings, of the human race. We have rejected this, but they're not very far from the surface. However, these have not taken root deep enough and often regressions are all too common as we see all around us. But back to our principal theme about science, Arthur Clarke once again pointed out, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And he had actually in mind the possible visitation by a civilization that's maybe 50,000 years ahead of us, we just wouldn't be able to deal with them at all. Now that's a little theme I'd like to take a small digression on. We've often have thought, often had to think about uh, what happens if you encounter aliens, really? Would they bother with us and so on? What would you expect? What would you expect of a person from the 16th century who comes to our world today and sees what's going around, the kind of magic that goes on? It would be like magic. When he sees a small device here which has got more computing power than the, what was there even 15 years ago in all the computers, it's incredible. At at the touch of a wall, you may have light. At the touch of a switch, you have light. You have incredible power at your hands. It'd be completely finished with culture shock. There would be a few ancient minds who could still cope with it. Maybe Galileo or Archimedes or Bhaskara or Brahmagupta, they could have coped with it, but not the ordinary person. Now imagine if something is 50,000 years ahead of us and makes a visitation to us. We just wouldn't be able to understand their purposes, their motives, or anything about them or anything about their science either. Okay. What would you expect of such a being? What should be our reaction to such a being? Well, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one thing we can hope that these beings would demonstrate, and that is compassion. The same sort of compassion that we would demonstrate towards an ant, which if it could speak, asked you, would you please not step on me? You'd certainly move your foot to oblige. Perhaps that's the best we can expect. So it's a good humbling thought to keep that in mind, to realize that whatever progress we've made, uh, it's marginal so far. We're just beginning. And there, are, there may be entities in the universe far ahead of us. We need to keep that in mind. But to get back to our uh, theme again, perhaps because of the human tendency to accept magic unquestioningly, the most sophisticated devices are now taken for granted by everybody. 
the awesome technology that, and science that underlie these gadgets are ignored in some sense. There has been no commensurate growth in the understanding or appreciation of science in the general populace though. The general population is in fact amazingly blasé about these developments, takes it for granted. Nor has there been any downturn in the belief that in thaumaturgy, thaumaturgy is alive and well, again perhaps because of an innate human yearning for magic of various kinds. To me, the best illustration of this peculiarity is in the very special effects produced in, by science and technology for the Harry Potter movies. Incredibly wonderful science is used to make it appear that natural laws are suspended by magical incantations to produce, well, magical effects. How much greater should the science be, the magic of the science be, that it can make magic look real? And yet very few appreciate this meta-magic of science, preferring to revel, revel in the rather ordinary and far less interesting world of capricious ordinary magic. That is a pity, but that's the way it is, and we take it, we have to take it, that's the way human beings are. Now this state of affairs by itself is very unfortunate, but it would be amusing. It would not be serious. It would not be alarming. We could put it down to the general human reluctance to indulge in protracted abstract thought. This was expressed very trenchantly and beautifully by Bertrand Russell long ago when he said, most people would rather die than think, and many of them do. Which is true all around us. We'd like to switch off our minds and watch the idiot box. This is an innate human tendency in all of us. We have to make an effort in order to keep our machine going, the thinking machine going. But what is not so amusing, however, is that there has been a considerable increase in the various multitudinous forms of purportedly scientific chicanery that assail the common man from all sides. This is paradoxical. And these bits of pseudoscience aid and abet in the propagation of newer and newer forms of irrationality with no diminution of the existing and very onerous baggage which already exists. In a macabrely ironic twist, Technology itself is used to aid the charlatanry, as in the case of computerized horoscopes. Of all the uses that you can put a computer to, horoscopes. And it's called computerized horoscopes and somehow it makes it more reliable because it's got a computer running through the possibilities. That's the common thing. I recently heard of something called the Vastu Compass, which is advertised. It's an Android app on Google can check it out and house builders swear by it even if you don't like it you have to if you're trying to sell a house you have to say it's vastu compliant a beautiful phrase that's been invented by in our country even more perversely the very language of science is appropriated and used as jargon to claim res respectability for pseudoscience and to assert the correctness or veracity or truth of various kinds of hocus pocus, quantum healing comes to mind. What does quantum have to do, quantum mechanics have to do with healing? And yet when you put these two words together, it becomes very powerful and whoever thinks of it first gets laughs all the way to the bank. There's nothing quantum mechanical about this at all. It's just plain chicanery. But the moment you attach something as respectable as quantum mechanics to it in the public mind, this immediately makes it profound and something totally new and therefore totally correct. That's part of the illusion. In other words, science itself has been hijacked by pseudoscience for propagating sheer nonsense in many ways. Now this again would be something we could laugh about, but as we all know, very harmful and adverse effects sometimes ensue. We all know about cases where extremely harmful effects have arisen from the fact that horoscopes are matched in a particular way, lives have been broken, families have been shattered, and so on, due to belief in astrology, due to belief in other forms of uh, pseudo, apparently scientific, pseudo-scientific nonsense. For instance, you may say that this Vastu compass 
you may say it's jugad. We've risen to the occasion and we used one for the other, but actually to me it's a travesty and a slap in the face of rationality. What's the underlying reason for all this, for all this state of affairs? I'm not a psychologist, and here now I enter into the realm of pure speculation, and you probably will disagree with me, I'm not a psychologist, but I have thought a little bit about it, watching people and so on. I do know that it seems to be a manifestation of another very peculiarly human trait, which is selective blindness, or what I call cherry-picked rational thinking. In other words, there's an incredible dichotomy of thought in most people's minds. That's an intellectual feat by itself that you can keep these two compartments separated in your mind without any connection whatsoever. The ability to keep things apart in compartments in your mind is not to be sneezed at. I'm very reminded of the theme of Hoyle's black cloud, the, the black cloud. Let me just spend a couple of minutes and tell you what it is. This has to do, it's a science fiction story. It had to do with the advent of a black cloud, an enormous black cloud from interstellar space, which comes to the vicinity of the Earth. And through radio messages and so on, they soon discover that this is an intelligent cloud. There's actually, it's intelligent life. And it's amazed that there are human beings on a solid object like a planet. Okay. So each side is absolutely amazed at the other. But the cloud is infinitely ahead of us as far as technology is concerned. And then at one stage, they manage to establish communication with this cloud, and they decide to probe this cloud for scientific knowledge to find out where to go next, etc. So they connect up a radio receiver or whatever the technology of the 50s was to, in order to receive messages, to understand what happens. And to cut a long story short, the protagonist of the story, the chief scientist, Kingsley, a young man, he volunteers, and the cloud directly starts talking to him through his brain. And in three days, he dies of brain fever. And the reason he gives is very interesting. Before he dies, he analyzes and figures out why this happened to him. And he said, you know, the irony is if this had happened to, and they have a gardener there in that station, a man called Stoddard, who is not very educated and is dull and is a little slow in my, of thought and so on. And Kingsley says to his uh, people around him when he's about to die, he says, you know, ironically, if you'd put Stoddard there in my place, nothing would have happened because he didn't have anything that had to be erased and a new piece of information put in. But what happened to me, and this is Kingsley speaking, was he said, I have a certain established body of knowledge which I think is scientific and so on and so forth, but when I discover that the real truth is far ahead, it's very different and there is conflicts between the two, I made a mental note that I should reject the old and keep the new over it, but I wasn't fully successful in doing it and due to overload, the, gets brain fever and he dies. But I feel that uh, our people in particular would not have had any problem because they'd have said, <laughs> that's knowledge, that's fine. It's like what uh, I often say, the laws of black body radiation are very often only applicable on the blackboard and outside that plane it's astrology. <laughs> we would not have had that difficulty. But unfortunately, Kingsley did. So this dichotomy what I call selective rationality of the human race is absolutely incredible. Now, you know, you take real numbers that are either rational or irrational. A real, every real number is either rational or irrational. There's nothing in between, just these two possibilities. On the other hand, people are not like that. There's no such thing as a partially rational number, but human beings are radically different. They are selectively rational to a very high degree. Certain things appear to them to be rational, and certain other things which are not their favorites appear to be irrational. And this is again expressed most beautifully by Martin Gardner himself in the preface to the second edition of his book. And that was a hilarious one. It's so hilarious that I'm going to read out a part of it. It says, the first edition of this book prompted many curious letters from irate readers. The most violent letters came from the Reichians Furious because the book considered ergonomy alongside, to them, outlandish cults as Dianetics. In other words, they believed in ergonomy, but they hated being lumped together with Dianetics, which is another form of pseudoscience. By the way, Tom Cruise is a great fan of Dianetics and general semantics and so on. I heard from homeopaths 
who were insulted to find themselves in company with such frauds as osteopathy and chiropractic. And one chiropractor in Kentucky pitied me because I had turned my spine on God's greatest gift to suffering humanity, namely chiropractic. Several admirers of Dr. Bates favored me with letters so badly typed. This is the gentleman who said, you don't need glasses. You can you know, do palming and you can get perfect vision. Several admirers of Dr. Bates favored me with letters so badly typed that I suspect the writers were in urgent need of strong spectacles. <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, and this is the punchline, most of these correspondents objected to one chapter only, thinking all the others excellent. So you see, in other words, one's pet piece of quackery or charlatanry alone is perfectly legitimate and honest. All others are total nonsense. Haven't we all heard this? Haven't we all heard say, all these other medical fads are quackery, but now take, and now fill in the blank. It could be your own medical fad, X or Y or Z, I'm not going to name. It could be naturopathy, homeopathy, whatever. It's absolutely and totally true and genuine. Why? Proof. It cured my aunt's asthma. Second proof, it cured my uncle's jaundice. And here, rigorous, perfect, complete, unassailable proof, it cured my aunt's asthma and my uncle's jaundice. Therefore, you know. So, this is the problem. The problem is that we are selective in our minds about what we think is rational, what is not, and that's a human trait. On the other hand, there are many human traits, there are many suicidal human traits which we have to overcome as rational beings, and this is one of them. We have to have the courage of our